Good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Welcome to Virtual Toll Puddle. Uh, we are live on Facebook, Zoom, and pre going to be recorded on YouTube. Uh, my name is Stangham Debonair. I am the Member of Parliament for Bristol West and the Shadow Secretary of State for Housing. And I'm pleased to say we've got a fantastic panel this afternoon. Please keep your questions coming in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen if you're on Zoom and introduce yourselves on the chat. I'm going to introduce our speakers now. And as I introduce them, I'm going to ask them if they would introduce themselves back with a mm, few words, minute maybe, on what Black Lives Matter has meant to them, emotionally, personally, professionally, whichever take you want to. So Shivana, Shivana Taj is Wales's General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress and the first um, Black or Minority Ethnic General Secretary. And as she's starting her new role, she has vowed to stand up for workers in Wales under threat from the impact of Brexit, from climate change and automation. I mean, you've got, you basically got everything covered there, Shivana, and you've got your work cut out. She's come to the Wales TUC from the uh, PCS, Public and Commercial Services Union, and where she was, Welsh Secretary, I got this right, since 2013. So, Shivana, can you tell us what Black Lives Matter means to you? So, what Black Lives Matter means to me is that, um, I think from a personal perspective, I'm, I'm a parent to two young uh, black children. Um, they are very aware of, of who they are, partly because of what they see around them, but also what they see in the home. Um, but also because um, the amount of people that have come out from all different types of backgrounds. Um, in previous demonstrations and everything, we saw, you know, generally we would see trade unions or organized sort of community grassroots action groups, but now the types of people that we're seeing on our streets and the fact that they are demanding change at a time of a public health pandemic, I think that we can take a lot from that. Thank you, Shifana. It's good to have you with us. And next, Roger McKenzie, Unison Assistant General Secretary. Uh, that's my union. I'm very proud to be a Unison member, uh, as well as, by the way, a Musicians Union member, in case any MU are listening. Uh, Roger is one of the UK's leading black trade unionists and as Assistant Gen Sec for Unison, uh, the largest trade union. Um, his trade union experience, however, started with a one-man strike when working as a painter and decorator, which is something I'd love to be asking you about, because that sounds really interesting. And as well as working for PCS and the TUC, he joined Unison 10 years ago. And it says here, which I found really fascinating and maybe you could bring this in at some point Roger that he recently interviewed Bill Lucy the trade union organizer who ran the Memphis refuse strike that Martin Luther King visited on the day that he was assassinated and I, I find that really poignant he's got no time for words like BAME or BME he's black his politics are black and he wants to see the trade union movement step up in the fight against racism so with that Roger in a few words what has the emergence of Black Lives Matter meant to you? Uh, thank, thanks, Thangham. Um, you've basically just said it, actually. And by the way, right. that dispute, um, I won that dispute as well okay. on my own, right? But I won it because people showed solidarity um, with me, with my one little cardboard picket line sign um, outside of a painting and decorating firm. Um, and people responded to that and refused to cross the picket line. So that was wonderful. What, what does um, Black Lives Matter mean for me? Um, it means um, potential for change. Um, it means there's a, a real potential um, for turning this really extraordinary moment that we're in um, into a movement, a movement that's going to bring about radical um, systemic um, and irreversible change, um, because I think that's what we need at the moment. We cannot allow this to be just another moment um, where people get away with just having quick fixes. Um, this is an opportunity for us for real change. Thank you, Roger. And I'm sure that you, like probably everyone on this panel today, we've sat on enough panels. We've done a lot of discussing. I think quite a few people are feeling like, well, we're a bit panelled out. What we really need is the action. So I'm hoping that this panel can be a way of stimulating and inspiring people to make that change. It's just occurred to me, and Innes, you might be able to help us here. Do we actually have a hashtag for anyone that wants to tweet or do anything on social media? Um, if we do, if you could just pop that in the chat, that'd be awfully helpful. Um, and I'm going to go on now whilst I'm hoping that someone's going to tell me we do have a hashtag because I just about understand what that means. And she has brilliant. Thank you, Inez. It's hashtag Tollpuddle 2020, of course. <laughs> 
Uh, Dr. Van der Viporska is Executive Director at the Equality Trust, and that's the national charity campaigning to reduce social and economic inequality. Uh, she's a visiting research fellow at the University of York, a trustee of the Association of Chief Executives of Voluntary Organisations, a Red Thread Youth, equally ours, and governor of a primary school, which is something dear to my heart. Uh, she's a regular keynote speaker and sits on or has advised a range of bodies, such as the CIVO Race Advisory po Panel, NUS Poverty Commission, Sex Education, forum advisory with loads of them so Wanda you've got loads that we're you're bringing to the discussion this afternoon just like everybody here can you tell us what the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement has meant for you yeah and I think most importantly given that we're here at Toll Puddle I've also spent over a decade working in trade unions and I've been a trade unionist since about the age of 20. Mm. Um, for me um, it's personal again as a mother to hear somebody in their dying breath call for their mother I think touches all of us and all of our hearts but in the wider voluntary sector which is you know the tra trade unions are a part of the wider voluntary sector um, and the charity sector in particular and also seeing in the business sector that people are really trying to go a little bit beyond that performative black tile or the setting up of EDI groups and really coming out and saying we do want to change this. And I think the key part of, of this change and this systemic change that Roger mentioned is that we have to use this to boost the struggle that we've all been in and that our you know, generations before us have been in. But it's really going beyond the black and Asian communities. It's going into white communities where there are white people suddenly saying, actually, we can't stand by and watch this happen. So I think that allyship is really important. And to see a genuine intention for change. I've spoken to people over the last couple of weeks that have ranged from investors to FTSE 100 companies to just, you know, friends that I know from school. So, you know, there really is a moment here to absolutely turbocharge what we've all been doing for so long. I think you encapsulated that beautifully there, Wanda, and I'm looking forward to picking up on a few of those themes that people have already brought up, um, all of you. And I'm now going to turn to Marvin. Uh, Marvin is, is my mayor, uh, so I'm very happy to welcome him. Um, he is currently in, uh, in the mid under some trees, and actually I can't see him on the screen at the moment, so I'm hoping he's still there. Uh, Marvin was elected to be mayor of Bristol in May 2016. He's a Yale World Fellow, graduate of Operation Black Vote. He's worked and studied in the UK and the US, former BBC journalist, public health worker, voluntary sector manager, co-founder of City Leadership Programme, and as my mayor, he has developed the One City Plan for Bristol. And he's also been at the centre of various media storms over the last few weeks because it was in Bristol and actually in my constituency Bristol West that that Colston statue was pulled down and then last week another one put up and then taken down again so there's been a bit of statue going on and I wonder Marvin could you tell us personally professionally what has this movement meant for you over the last few weeks? So it's, it's a time of incredible opportunity um, I, I read a quote recently that was saying it's in in times of great turmoil that the impossible becomes possible um, and, you know, you align up Black Lives Matter uh, with uh, COVID, uh, with the economic turmoil, and the turmoil will, we were in anyway that, that maybe uh, you know, that sat silently behind our events. There's a great opportunity. But if I can open the door to a great threat too, um, and the threat is that we don't take this opportunity, just like we failed to take previous opportunities, civil rights movement, anti-globalization protests, financial crisis, civil rights movement, Cold War, and, uh, you know, there's been areas of great promise that we've not managed to harvest. It's a time that absolutely requires us to be very clear on what we mean by racism. Even yesterday, I had a, a conversation with a, quite an activist who basically wanted us to sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya. And I was trying to say, this has to be about power. All right? This is about economics and politics. It's not about just being nice to each other and being educated about each other's cultures. Um, so we've got to be on top of our, our, our understanding. Thank you, Marvin. And thanks for bringing power into the discussion, which I think is something we're going to bring back. I know there's been a couple of people say in the chat they prefer the gallery view. I'm not sure. I think we'll probably go back to that once we've done the introductions. Um, I'm next going to introduce uh, uh, Patrick. Um, I'm just checking that I have got everyone because I've actually next in has got Wilf. And I don't see Wilf. 
no so i'm going to move on to patrick um patrick roach who dr patrick roach he's general secretary of the nas uwt uh, teachers union my mother's union so i feel very attached to it um it's the largest U union in the uk that exclusively represents teachers and head teachers and principals he was appointed gensec in april 2020 what a time to take on a new brief having previously served as deputy gensec for the te previous 10 years formerly a teacher of politics and sociology in further education and a researcher and lecturer in education, social policy and equalities in higher education. And Innes is saying we will go back to gallery shortly. So finally, Patrick, in a few words um, before we go on to a wider discussion, what has the emergence of Black Lives Matter meant to you? Well, thanks very much, Dame, and, uh, and good afternoon to you and to um, everyone that's gathered for, for this event at, at Tollpoddle. I mean, you know, um, no one could uh, not have been moved by, you know, frankly, the shocking images that we saw being played out on, on our screens uh, of the murder of, of George Floyd. But that was a, a, a moment, a real catalyst uh, for, for change. And as um, other colleagues on this panel have said, you know, that moment has, um, has sparked a movement um, and a renewal of a movement, because I think we've all been part of a movement for racial justice now for for many years um, but it's required a further catalyst uh, or spur for, for action one of the things that's really impressed me about this moment is how um, that has created an opportunity really for a broad based coalition uh, for change for racial for racial justice and i think that uh, there is a recognition about the moral obligation to um, to paraphrase uh, the words of um, uh, John Lewis, who sadly passed away today, um, that moral obligation to uh, to speak out and to to take action uh, in the face of you know unfairness and injustice in our world. And um, if we can uh, begin to harness uh, that moral obligation and see that as part and parcel of our obligation as trade unionists. Uh, civil rights activists, uh, then we can really make the, 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 the change that's going to make the real difference uh, to the lives of not only uh, black people in this country, um, but to all people in this country and around the world. Thank you, Patrick. And as you can see, those of you watching, there's just a huge amount of campaigning and life and work experience on this panel. And I'm going to ask them uh, all, if possible, to try and speak in their own voice for the for on behalf of themselves but if you do feel you're also speaking on behalf of your organization please feel free to bring that in as well um many of us have i said uh, have been on panels before and i suppose lots of people perhaps everyone uh, who's spoken so far has said you know what's going to be the difference has got to be the action how can we turn that campaigning energy particularly bringing in young people and uh, wonder mentioning uh, you know white people who've said we up with this we will not put who want to be involved and uh, people in the chat are saying the same thing how can that be turned how can we harness that energy and turn it into concrete action because a lot of us i'm going to include myself here i've been around the block a few times i can remember demonstrations in the 70s and 80s and i think so what's different about now how are we going to take marvin's warning words about not losing the opportunity uh, and turn it into real concrete action and what do you think that concrete action needs to look like who'd like to kick us off haha <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to volunteer you. <laughs> okay, wonder. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not going to answer the question directly, which is okay. a new That's thing, all right. politician. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I would say is, is that question brings out one of the one of the key issues, which is how we engage with other generations. Um, because I hope nobody on the panel minds us saying we are all of a certain age on this panel, aren't we? Um, <laughs> it's a good age, it's an experienced <laughs> age, but nevertheless, what I'm seeing, and especially in the charity sector, is this dissonance between younger activists who are, you know, going through a lot of these things for, for the first time, but who are also a lot more aware and who are working through social media and, and other channels as well. And those of us who have, as, as you've said, been around the block, seen some of these things, fought some of these battles already. And I think what we really need to do is have that coming together because we can learn from each other. We can learn from what they're doing. They can learn from, from our experience. And I think one thing that's, that's different now is that we did all see those pictures of George Floyd, unfortunately. 
you know, and we've seen them happening just down the road from me in Islington in this country a couple of days ago. And we are seeing this and the more people see, the less they can deny it and the less they can claim ignorance. So I think those are key issues that will fuel the actions that we're taking, but it also keeps the issue alive. And this is a key thing. If we come back a year from now to Toll Puddle next year, what change will we have seen and what part will we have played in that change? So I think, Patrick, you just waved your hand at me and forgive me if any other panellists do feel free just to lift your hand if you're ready to come in. Patrick, where do you want us to be in a year's time when we come back to Toll Puddle? Well, um, I'd certainly uh, like to think that we would be able to come back um, saying uh, what progress we have made, but we've got to be clear about what progress we're seeking to make. Um, and uh, we shouldn't uh, assume that, um, you know, um, one less violent death of a black man on our streets uh, constitutes progress. Um, uh, what we need to be very clear about is what injustice means and what it looks like, how it manifests itself and what we want to change. But how can we bring about that change? Well, you know, I I'm representing a, a, a trade union um, and um, one of the critical mechanisms that is available to me is what our members do, what our activists do in workplaces. And of course, you know, schools are set to reopen uh, fully again um, in September. We hope, um, let's hope that will be the case. Well, those are places for organizing and we need to think about how we um, engage with our members um, of all ages, um, uh, uh, male, female, uh, black and white in um, that campaign for racial justice. But as educators as well, I think we've got a role and a responsibility. I spoke earlier about moral obligation. I think there is a moral obligation to connect with uh, children and young people. I mean, children's lives have been uh, impacted seriously as a result of, you know, coronavirus lockdown. Many, for many children, their mental health has been scarred as a result of this pandemic. But one of the things that children have also witnessed, as we have testified here, is they've witnessed being played out on their screens, um, you know, a racist murder of a black man on the streets. And that will have impacted on the lives of many young people returning to school. So we have a moral obligation as well, as teachers, as educators, to connect with young people in our classrooms, as well as organizing within our staff rooms uh, for racial justice. And that has got to be a key opportunity, I think, for us as trade unionists to, to really make a difference here. Thank you, Patrick. And I think bringing in trade unionism is, is important because this is why we're here. I'm going to go to Marvin next, even though Shivana and Roger both got their hands up. I'm worried that Marvin, out of doors, is using up his phone battery and we might lose him. So, Marvin, um, there's a, a few thoughts there. I mean, about, there's about bringing in young people. What would progress look like for you by the time we get to a year from now in Bristol, do you think? So I, I just pick up on something Patrick just shared there that's really important. I think we've got to know what we're, what we're trying to get done. So I'll tell you, just yesterday I had a conversation with someone who shared with me they were one of the people involved in pulling the statue down and a new statue going up. And I said to him, well, what is the specific policy outcome you're trying to attach it to? Mm. Well, he had none. Um, I said, well, there's a whole range of drivers of structural inequality, race and class. It's inequalities in housing, in education, mental health, criminal justice system, employment, poverty, child hunger. You know, I didn't want to rag on him, but you know, and I reminded them that when King um, was on the Selma march, they had a specific idea of what they wanted to achieve. Um, and it was a voting rights act. Before that, it was a civil rights act. Before that, it was obviously desegregation of the schools or desegregation, desegregation of the bus network. And, and I, I, it just strikes me, we just really need to be clear. This is not just about throwing out a generic, uh, we are going to love each other and um, you know, we're, we, we believe uh, uh, black lives matter. It has to look like real policy. It, I actually think that one of the key areas that I'd like us to be able to get our heads around is housing. I, I said one of the biggest uh -huh. expressions of race inequality in the last um, five years has been Grenfell. Yeah. Um, and, and housing, whether it be ghettos, uh, whether it be no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, or be it gentrification today, or one of the biggest expressions of race inequality. That doesn't always look dramatic because it takes time to build houses and affordable homes. Um, so we have to be also minded that not every action on race in, uh, tackling racism looks dramatic and, and, and looks flamboyant. Some of these are just the nuts and bolts of, of tackling a, an unjust economic system. 
So you're speaking my language there because housing's my brief and many of you will have perhaps read the Resolution Foundation's report that came out a couple of weeks ago about housing during COVID and the huge disparity between the experiences of, of white people and large numbers of black, Asian and other minority ethnic people was really, I, it wasn't surprising but it was shocking. Um, and the inequality of the quality of housing and of the cost. I'm going to bring Shivana in next and then Roger, but also Marvin, while you're keeping an eye on your phone battery, I'm going, to, I, I'm going to want to come back to you fairly soon on following up some of the questions coming in in the chat, one of which is about uh, whether racial inequality is a fundamental feature of capitalism. And if you had the power to do it, what action would you take? And I think you've started on that one with housing, but I'm going to ask all the panel a bit about that. Shivana, do you want to pick this up for us next? Yeah, so um, being based in Wales, I guess um, um, we're lucky that we actually do have a, a Welsh Labour government that, that does engage with trade unions and works in social partnership. Um, and as a because of the fact that you know we do have that, um, we have been able to introduce some changes. Um, one of them being that um, Black history will be taught um, within education in Wales. So, so that's already been agreed. There's a series of um, other recommendations that um, a group of uh, black uh, workers and specialists who got together um, have made in relation to the socioeconomic uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19. We know that we've got longer term work to be done as far as equality overall in the public and the private sector is concerned as far as justice and housing and so forth and education. But as far as the workplace is concerned, we do really need to start tackling um, the, the real systemic inequalities and discrimination that exists because, um, and, 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 I, and I talk in a CUC voice now, and that is, is that our recent polling that we did and, and some of our data came out yesterday, just re, reaffirmed what we already knew uh, was the case before COVID even happened. So the data tells us that one in five black people have said that they'd uh, been treated unfairly at work because of their ethnicity, and this was specifically during COVID-19, that around one in six black workers had said that they felt more exposed um, and um, being asked to do much more difficult jobs, um, and that they were being overly exposed to COVID-19, that they uh, were not being provided with the appropriate PPE and so forth. And, you know, this was not just in health and social care, although that is where we, we heard some, real, some of the real horrendous stories. Um, you know, this existed across the transport sector in education and so forth as well. So if anything, um, it, it's just reproved, it's, it's reproven what we already knew. I think that what we, what we, I agree with what some of the, the previous panelists have said that we need to be clear in terms of what our asks are. Um, but I am also very conscious of the fact that we need to be organizing better and we need to be taking into account the fact that there are a number of young people who are leading these demonstrations on our streets and so forth. And we in Wales here, we have been trying to work much more closely um, with people whilst respecting that you know, there are going to be intergenerational differences, but at the same time, there can be some real inter intergenerational solidarity as well. And I think that the, we, we do need to start looking at the workplace, looking at employment rights. We need to get rid of zero hour contracts. All of these systems and all, all of these types of inequalities are partly the reason why so many black people at the moment have been at risk and are dying on the job. Thanks, Shivana. So we've got housing needs sorting out, we've got employment needs sorting out, we've got things in schools and education. Roger, what do you want to add to that? What, what, what actions would you like to see us having taken in the next year that would mean, mean, mean real and sustained change? Of course, one of the most um, kind of obvious things that needs to be dealt with um, within the next few months is the um, grotesque way that black people have been put in harm's way during this um, pandemic. Um, and the government really has to be held to account um, for what it's done um, over that. Um, so in terms of something immediate, that's what um, I, I think um, needs to be looked at. So, I mean, we've all seen reports forever, you know, I mean, I've seen too many, um, read too many, been to too many conferences about them, and the books about the conference and all sorts, you know, I mean, this just goes on and on and on. And actually what we don't see is sustainable change. And the point that I made in my introduction points, um, I want to come back to a minute, um, 
is, is that we can't allow organizations to do what they always do, which is to try and get away with quick fixes. Um, so this moment that we're in and all the talk about turning it into a movement is really important. But why we have to keep some momentum going um, behind this is because organisations traditionally do turn to trying to do a quick fix solution just to try and stop people from demonstrating, to try and stop a whole movement from, from springing up. And I think that's a task that we've got. I think what's really, really interesting about this moment is that um, a load of young people, black and white, which I think is really, really interesting and really important. They're not waiting for the kind of traditional institutions to do this stuff for them. They're just going out on the streets and, and organizing. Even though a lot of these demonstrations, um, uprisings in some way, um, are called um, Black Lives Matters, I'm actually that many of them aren't linked to particular organ an organization called black lives matter people are just deciding that we are going to say assert that black lives matter and they are going out and organizing now i'm an organizer and i think it's really you know i'm trying to tell people all the time that we all have the ability to be able to go out and organize and what we're seeing with these um in this moment is people actually doing it final point I, I'd, I'd like to make, make if I could thank him because I think the th a thread through this discussion so far I think is absolutely vital and it's this is that uh, we, we can't have this as 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 Marvin was saying earlier on as, as some kind of kumbaya moment um, I have never ever been somebody who believes in um, equality or freedom is on that mountain so far away that we can barely see it. I've never been that kind of person. I think we can count it. I think we can count equality. I think we can count freedom. And I think the points that are being made about housing and education are really vital in us being able to do that. And last point really about education. Um, because um, it's been mentioned a few times. I, I think it's really, really important that we deal with this issue about um, just looking at um, the uprisings against colonialism, as important as that is, the uprisings against slavery. But my history, the history of my people started way before that right way before and i think that's what those are the things that need to be on the curriculum as well now i'm glad you brought that up roger i'm going to come back to everyone about education uh, if i can before the end of our time together because i've been talking to the schools on my patch about you know it isn't it shouldn't just be about are you doing anti-racism work it should be are you teaching about the history of mathematics which began in babylon and india several several long thousand years before the greeks caught on you know are you, we, how are you teaching different subjects so i wanted to pick up with marvin who is the mayor of a whole city um and therefore has to try and bring a whole mixed population of half a million people with him uh, and is accountable to all of those half a million people. How do we bring the whole population with us? And I'm thinking partly because some of you've already mentioned the fact that young people, both white and black, have got involved, that people who haven't necessarily been active in, in political protest have got involved. And we want to harness that in some way. How do you think, Marvin, that we can capture the whole, bring a whole city with us? Well, we've been trying to do that um, in many ways. There's a danger, isn't there, that um, people live in their bubble and they think everyone looks like them. Oh, or sorry, everyone uh, thinks like them. Not so <laughs> within the social media bubble, everyone was elated that Colson got pulled down. And honestly, one of, the, one of the most popular phrases I get on social media is the people of Bristol, on behalf of the people of Bristol. People who are not self-appointed, <laughs> well, they are self-appointed, telling me that they're, what they are saying to me is what the people of Bristol want. It goes on all the time. And actually, Bristol's a very complicated city. Um, there are people who are elated that Colston was pulled down. There are some people who actually are sympathetic that he came down, but are dismayed by the way it happened. And there are people that feel that um, Colston is somehow Bristol and that by being pulled down, they've lost a piece of themselves. Uh, and what we have to do is, is be able to build relationships with all those people because not everyone who was concerned about Colston coming down is a racist. I actually went out to meet some of the football lads who organised the rally at the Cenotaph the, the, um, the weekend after, right? And they were at pains to point out that they were not far right, the ones I was, I, I was meeting. And in fact, one of them was mixed race and he's not far right, but they, they had concerns about, and there's all sorts of sub-conflict going on here, right? Some were far right, but not everyone was far right. And if we just label all working class white people that are concerned about what happened as far right, we'll end up in a really bad situation. The way I've tried to do it is this, and it's the reason why we took the statue down the other day. We're saying there's going to be a process, right? The process is going to be 
looking at Bristol's history and all its fullness about black people, working class, trade unions, women, uh, gay people, migrants, children. We're going we're gonna to tell the full story of Bristol. And through that journey, hopefully we'll be in a better position to assess the people that have been held up as heroes and new people we might want to be our heroes. And then as a city with that fuller information, we'll make an assessment of what goes up. Now, what we don't want to do is sub uh, circumvent that process. So it looks like one person has decided, even if they do claim to be the voice of, of Bristol. And it's the, it's the process that makes sure that even if you don't get what you want, and even if you get what you don't want, you know you've been respected uh, by the city. But we do need to hold together uh, people who are fearful at the moment as well, because they may not be overtly fascist or racist like some people are just dismissing them. They might just be scared because the world around them is changing and they don't know what to do and they're kicking out. And we need to build solidarity. I think we've lost Marvin to his battery. Oh, Marvin, are you still there? Well, we'd come to a good point, uh, and I'm glad that I, I, I'm, I'm apologised to all other panellists, but that's why I wanted to catch Marvin before his, his battery died. I know how it is when you're out of doors. I wondered if we could turn to education now, because some of you have already alluded to it, and people emailed me in their thousands, I've got to tell you, I've been emailed in the space of about 48 hours around the time the Colson statue came down in my constituency. It was four figure sums of people who were emailing me, but actually most of them wanted to talk about education. So what does that mean? What do you think that looks like? Marvin talked there about involving the whole city and telling the story of the whole city. So that's, it's not just about schools, um, but it is about, it, it does include schools. It maybe starts with schools, maybe it doesn't. What do you think? I'm, I'm going to go first to Patrick as a representative of a teacher's union. Yeah, I mean, and I think you quite rightly say there, Pang, I mean, it's not just about schools. It is, uh, schools are part of the, uh, of the jigsaw in terms of education, but actually we should be talking about more than uh, just schools. I mean, at the end of the day, we've had since 2010 a, a massive assault, uh, quite honestly, on public education uh, in, in this country, uh, not just in terms of school cuts, um, but also in terms of cuts to... Um, to libraries, to galleries, to uh, youth and community provision, all of which were about, uh, frankly, um, the development and nurturing of uh, the next generation, the space in which um, uh, you can explore your identity, your sense of belonging, um, your history, and indeed um, uh, the, the contribution that you can make and develop your, your potential. And, and, and so much of that ha has gone. We've also seen since 2010, of course, Assault, an assault on education within our schools. Um, we've actually seen um, uh, the uh, removal of, frankly, a, an entitlement to a, a, a national curriculum. Now, we may all have different viewpoints on what should be in a national curriculum, what shouldn't be in a national curriculum, but the very idea of an entitlement in respect of what children and young people uh, should be learning is seemingly has, 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 been, has been removed. And that is profoundly unhelpful as a government has pressed ahead with an agenda of privatization of, of our education landscape, the academization process, uh, and, and so on. Um, when we then get on to what is taught, of course, then uh, within, within schools, whether that's around the teaching of history, but actually it's about much more than the teaching of history. We need to be looking at how we decolonize the entirety of the curriculum, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, um, colleagues on this panel have already referred to, you know, the teaching of, uh, of mathematics, um, you know, uh, the teaching of science, um, the teaching of, of music and the arts. Um, all of these are areas uh, that are frankly ripe for the, for the unpacking, for um, uh, beginning to understand the contributions um, uh, that have been made um, from communities right around the world um, uh, from a, a, a non-colonial uh, perspective. So there is work to be done there. And of course, that work's got to be supported by teachers and, and staff working in schools who are trained and who are ready for that task, for that activity. Um, and it's vitally important, again, that government is investing in the profession to deliver those entitlements for children and young people. Uh, regrettably, however, we've had a government that has been uh, much more committed um, to uh, removing those entitlements and in removing those entitlements for asserting a particular form of education, which is not only narrow, but which is also exclusive. 
Thank you. And I'm going to come to Wanda next because I really want to hear from you about how you think we can embed uh, embed a concept of a, a really good reflective national curriculum across all aspects of the curriculum. And we've also got in the Q&A a very long contribution, very thoughtful from Ekwa Bayanu Ukbeonu uh, about um, embedding information um, and, and, and undoing disinformation. Um, and you've talked a lot of there about sort of uh, deconstructing white imperialism and slavery. And just there's so much there. I would love to unpack all of that. But Wanda, I wonder if you could, you could take, take the next step in helping us to understand what we mean here. Yeah, I think um, having had the pleasure of working in an education union for, for four years, um, one of the things I would say is to take, a, take that further step back. I absolutely agree with everything Patrick's saying, but in all honesty, we do have to take into consideration the makeup of the workforce in education and the fact that it is so predominantly white. Um, and this, this is an issue, you know, we have to look at why people aren't going into education. And I think we all know some of the reasons why people don't become teachers or go back into education. So one thing is the workforce, as well as the academization and fragment, fragmentation of the education system. Um, but I think there's a wider issue here as well, which is about what we're teaching in schools and whether we're teaching that critical thinking and in particular a sort of political education an education about what the system is who it's there you know to serve and so that's why and now i speak as as director of the equality trust we are developing educational resources um, to unpack inequality to look at inequality and to we've been working with some young people across london um, to explain in a sense and to stimulate their thoughts about why are they in the housing that they're in why are their parents in the jobs that they're in if they're working you know can they spot these patterns and these trends and they realize and use their own lived experience to see the reality of what we all know about the inherent inequality and discrimination in the system and so i think we need much more of that because you know these are the activists of the future and we need to make sure that we are empowering them at this point um, to understand the system so that then they know how to challenge it. Thank you. I'm going to take us on a little bit with one of the questions that's come up in the chat, which I think a socialist and we're at a trade union conference, I think is, is good at least to have a look at it. Uh, and that is, can we, is racial inequality just a fundamental feature of capitalism? Is there a way of undoing discrimination without undoing capitalism? And I just wondered if we could start by perhaps with Shivana. Um, as a TUC General Secretary, do we need to re redo the whole of capitalism, scrap it completely, or can we find a way of accommodating it? Um, I think that we've spent a number of years um, trying to um, change it from within. I think that if anything, COVID-19 has, has just proven that um, capitalism really does work for the interests of the 1% or the 5%, depending on which figure you you run by. We know that, you know, frontline workers, key workers, they are the lowest paid and they are the ones that have been holding up the economy. Um, they are the ones that have been going out to work. They are the ones, many of them who actually are agency workers and, and are therefore, you know, being exploited in so many different ways, already were exploited before COVID happened and, and have now faced it even more so. Um, you know, just to, it, all we have to do is Let's look at the examples of, of what happened in Leicester a couple of weeks back as far as the factories and were concerned and where there was an outbreak and predominantly a large proportion of um, Asian workers, many of them who had, you know, who were definitely paid well below the minimum wage. The fact of the matter is, is that if government, you know, doesn't put the resources in to actually have inspectors that go in um to can you know to see what exactly is going on and what's on the books and what's happening in reality those people are going to continue being exploited i mean at the moment it you know just based on hmrc's own own sort of reporting figures um you're likely to get a visit um by an inspector one in 500 years or something the, the figures are absolutely insane so exploitation you can get away with it so easily in the current system so if we are going to do better, then I think that we do have to um, find another way. Um, we do need to have um, a better society than the one that we do. And I think that's what I want to see after, um, you know, I think we need to start working on it now. Yes, you know, the, the, the UK government did something in terms of they introduced 
um, you know, some uh, a form of furlough. But again, there was no guarantee of the the other twenty percent coming from from the employer. So there was there was there was no there wasn't something for something. Now, of course, a lot of these schemes are going to be going. More people are facing redundancy. People are going to be um, you know unfairly discriminated against more so particularly we know the women are going to be impacted because you know there is no child care um, for many people at the moment so th th if we don't actually um, deal with if we if we really want to deal with equality and, and we do want to be more equitable um, and uh, and fairer as a society then I think yeah we do need to have a new system altogether okay um, Roger um, we've got that question about do we need to abolish capitalism before we can get rid of racism but I've also got here in the in the Q&A um, we've had some discussion about educating uh, children at schools and colleges what about educating older people and, and perhaps I'd push you into sort of your role um, how does that work in the trade union movement as bringers of political education Okay, um, I'm pretty sure I just heard Shivana come out um, for socialism for the um, for the Wales TUC, which is fantastic. With you, I'm with you, and I genuinely am actually because um, I've seen no evidence whatsoever um, that the current system that we live under um, or is done to us actually um, has um, is ever going to um, tackle the deep-seated racism um, that we um, experience at the moment. So. Um, for, for me, I'm a socialist, unapologetic, I am a socialist, and I believe that we need fundamental and radical change in this society in favour of working class people. I think when you start looking at um, the whole issue of um, racial capitalism, essentially, um, I think we, we really have to um, not apologise about talking about class and the importance of class in that discussion and far too many um, people kind of shy away it's like some kind of bogey word or something that is just too difficult to get into actually as part of this debate it is so critical at the moment because um, far too often black people are portrayed as not being part of any kind of real working class where something else and um, the working class is actually um, white people um, and I just think that's an, an appalling way um, of um, setting things out um, we are part of the working class and, and linking back to the issue of education and I'll get on to the adult education bit um, as well in a minute but for me um, I, I as I said earlier on I, I, I want us to think more broadly about the, the, the things that um, we are taught um, in our schools but I really also think there's an opportunity um, to, to, to think more widely about what's taught in adult education and in further and higher education what's left of those things because actually what's left of those things is very little they have as Patrick said earlier on been thoroughly decimated as part of the assault on public education but we as part of that assertion of black people as being part of the working class I, I want to be talking about what um, the contribution that black people have made to the building of the working class in this country and um, the great book on this issue actually um, recommendation for everybody um, is the making of the black working class um, in Britain um, by Ron Ramadan and he, he's, he, he does an extraordinary brilliant um, expose of all of the contributions um, or a lot of the contributions that have been made by black people um, within the trade union movement within the chartist movement and within a whole range of different issues but for me one of you know, the issue that never really gets talked about is um, things like the newer monitoring projects the south you know the um, south or monitoring all of these bodies newer monitoring you know all of these bodies that were set up as a way of not just monitoring racism but actually to build a resistance to racism um, and I think those are things that need to be taught you know it's not just about um, a black person was involved in inventing whatever that's important but also we made this contribution not just on our own but collectively as well and we are talking you know this is a movement about the collective and we shouldn't forget that that people have resisted racism have resisted um, the worst forms of capitalism um, not just on their own although there was some of that but collectively um, as well 
thank you. I am so pleased that this is being recorded because I've been trying to keep notes and I'm going to have to go back and record and watch the recording because this has been a really rich discussion. We've got about 10 minutes or so first uh, before we end. So if anybody has got anything else they want to pop in the Q&A box, I think we've touched on everything that's been put in there so far. Um, Patrick, I wondered how well you feel your profession is supported, equipped, resourced um, to take on some of that challenge and also how we take, go, how we go further and, you know, as Akua said in the chat, you know, how we educate ourselves and support others to self-educate. Yeah, I mean, thanks for that. I mean, how, how well supported is the teaching profession? Um, well, if we look at what the government has been doing for the last decade uh, and more, um, uh, not entirely as supported as the profession should should be. Um, uh, we know that, um, uh, as it were, there's been a massive uh, uh, crisis in relation to teacher recruitment and retention. Um, uh, the government may feel it's turned uh, a corner on, on that because as jobs are being hollowed out elsewhere in the economy, uh, more and more graduates are being driven uh, into teaching. Um, so that may get government over a particular hump at the moment, but in terms of teacher retention, the morale of teachers, um, uh, it, is, it is pretty low. And you know, we've seen teachers uh, in the midst of this crisis um, um, doing everything they possibly can to support children and young people, often um, despite uh, any action from government, despite um, uh, support from government and uh, in the absence of uh, the resources that teachers need to support children and particularly you know children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. I mean we've we've been hearing the debates haven't we in recent weeks about the government's promise of um, laptops to the poorest children and and, and frankly I, I still am left scratching my head where are those laptops because I'm being told there are hundreds of thousands of them but no one seems to be able to find them. So um, uh, are teachers being supported? Well, sure, teachers are trying to do their utmost to, to support children and young people, but you know, government has to step up here and give teachers and give uh, you know, children and young people the support that they need in the midst of this crisis. Can I just come back though to something that was, uh, we've just been talking about, I mean, in the context of capitalism, I'm not, I'm not gonna dis disagree with anything that colleagues have said in relation to, to, to that. Um, but it's, it is also important that we recall what we were saying earlier in this discussion about, you know, what progress actually looks like. Because my worry is that in 12 months time when we come back to review, well, what did change um, 12 months on from, as it were, COVID-19? Um, uh, we may be finding ourselves in the midst of one of the deepest economic crises uh, that the country has known and profoundly deep. Uh, for uh, black communities and you know I think we've got um, a, a moment in which um, we need to be um, you, you know calling that issue out and challenging government about um, how it's going to ensure that we are not going to be repeating um, the mistakes of the past you know, you know I, I kind of cut my teeth as a uh, in political activism if you will um, as a result of Margaret Thatcher's assault um, on working class people. And it wasn't just an assault on uh, the working classes per se. Um, you know, it was also a racialized, a racist assault on black communities as well. And, you know, with, um, uh, you know, black workers three times more likely to be unemployed then. In 2008, with the global financial crisis, we've seen that uh, massive disparity in terms of what's happened to uh, uh, black communities. And again, now in 2020, we're going to be finding uh, as Shavana was saying earlier, that actually one of the impacts of this crisis could be uh, that black workers um, uh, are losing out to employment, they're more likely to find themselves in precarious employment, zero hours contracts, and so on. Those are the issues that we're going to have to attend to. Those are the issues that we need, in Roger's words, to draw up the metrics and to measure progress against, because otherwise I suspect that we're going to be seeing a rolling backwards. 
So I think there's one really measurable thing that I'm going to ask you all about. And Wanda, I'm going to bring you in next. I know you've got something you want to follow up on there, but I'm going to add another question, which I'd like us to have attended to in the next eight minutes, if we can. It's come up in the chat, but it's, it's consequent from some of the things you've all been saying. We're all trade unionists. How do we either, this is a measurable thing we can be held responsible for and accountable for. How are we going to increase trade union membership from those Black Lives Matter activists, from young black people, from people in the precariat in those rubbish jobs how are we going to change the way trade unions work how do we need to change what a trade union is and how people get in touch with trade unions wonder i know you wanted to pick up on something else but if you could then segue neatly into that i'd be grateful because i want to hear from all of you before the end on that as this is a trade union event okay very quickly um there is something we can do in the next 12 months and that's campaigning for the socio-economic duty section one of the equality act which would lay the obligation on public bodies to take into account the effect of their policies and actions on socio and economically disadvantaged people and on inequality that's one thing we can do um and we need an inequality reduction strategy from the government we need the government to recognize as it signed up to the un sdgs one of which is to reduce inequality that this actually is an issue i'm not holding my breath over the next year though attracting people into trade unions this starts at school this starts i've been into schools and talked to people about trade unions and they've said wow i never knew about that why wouldn't you join a union so we all have that obligation, word of mouth, telling people we know, organising, but also organising in, in a different way because the workplace has changed. We're not organising in factories with huge numbers of people there. We're organising in the gig economy and that's really, really tough. And I was speaking to a FTSE 100 company a couple of months ago saying that actually they didn't need big offices anymore and that they were looking at people selling in their skills. Now, if that's happening at that high level, if they're adapting the gig economy, then we're really going to see a huge shift in the coming years. And trade unions need to be able to adapt to be where people are, not expecting people to come on a Wednesday evening at 6.30 to a meeting and join a committee. I think, you know, we've all been there. We all know what that's like. We need to be far more adaptive to the circumstances. And I understand how difficult that is. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of feet on the ground. But if we don't change, we, you know, we will not be able to protect all of those people who don't have a clue that employment law even exists. Thank you. Um, Patrick, how can we get more young black people, more activists, more young people into unions or adapt the trade union movement or both? Something that we can be measured against this time next year. Well, I think there's lots of things that we could be thinking about. I mean, clearly the landscape and the environment has got to be conducive to um, to black workers, um, uh, young and old, uh, being in unions, um, they'll, they'll also need to be in the workplace as well. So let's not lose sight of that. Um, but we need we need leadership, um, and we need strong leadership. We need leaders who are prepared to and will speak out on on race. Uh, we need more um, black leaders of our trade unions. I mean, it's as simple uh, as that. Um, uh, you know, and um, you know, without that, uh, if we have a union movement that uh, doesn't speak, speak like me, doesn't, doesn't look like me, doesn't speak for me, uh, then why would I want to be a, a part of that? Yeah, I think the trade union movement has done a huge amount in respect of uh, anti-racist activism, um, uh, but um, there have been some moments in our history as unions um, that we perhaps shouldn't be entirely proud uh, about. Um, this should be a moment for reflection for us as a movement, and this should be a moment in which we seek to change um, who we are, what we are, how we represent um, our members and how we represent on the issues of racial equality and racial justice. We've got to make that a top priority in our agenda within our individual unions and across the movement. So a couple of good comments that come in the chat before I move on to Roger. Uh, my own original union, I was a musician first and foremost, and I lived in the gig economy. That was how most musicians made our livings. So Musicians Union Writers Guild, Wanda's reminded us, have got a great track record, you know, going back decades of representing people literally in the gig economy, because uh, they are literally gigging. And um, also Darren McLaughlin's raised uh, various other trade unions and organisations who are doing good work with organising in the precariat. Um, Roger, I'm going to come to Siobhan Anna last. Um, so Roger, could you give us your thought please on how we're going to measure um, our activism as trade unionists in the next 12 months in relation to Black Lives Matter? I think it's really difficult to, to, to see this as a sprint. 
Yeah. Um, and and, and I, think that, I think we have to be cautious about that um, because I, I think we have to engage in this for the long term because I think one of the problems has been, and, and actually there's been a recognition of this by the TUC, actually. I mean, um, Patrick and myself are on the General Council um, of the TUC and the fact that we've had to go back and set up um, the TUC Stephen Lawrence Task Force again, uh, which um, thankfully, and I told you this would happen, that Patrick um, is going to be chairing um, that task force. So I think that's a wonderful, wonderful um, move. But the fact that we've had to go back and do that tells me that we really have to connect with this um, for the longer term. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just make this point um, before I finish so that shavana has got some time as well. Um, there was a question on earlier on um, on the chat on the Q&A about um, what would be the one thing that I would do and that we should do. And I want to answer that really clearly. I think we have to work to get rid of Boris Johnson because without getting rid of him, we're not going to actually see any real fundamental change. It is a disgrace that this country has a prime minister who's frankly a racist. And I think that's a real problem for us. I think the way he's going on, he might be got rid of by his own side. And then that might be a problem for those of us that want to replace the Tory government by a Labour government. But I'm completely with you, Roger. It's an absolute disgrace. I'm going to ask Shavana to have the last word on as we, we ended up with trade union, uh, the trade union movement and had to have you as a, uh, a black woman trade union uh, TUC general secretary in Wales is great great for us. How do you think we need to be doing this over the next 12 months? Well, I think uh, like many, uh, many of my colleagues have said, you know, this is, uh, we, we can't treat it as a sprint, but nonetheless, I think the union movement just needs to be prepared to get uncomfortable. And sometimes you need to hold up a mirror um, and have that conversation. And there are a lot of people within our movement who think it is just simply about being anti-racist, but they don't actually accept um, that they might be a part of the problem themselves. So I think that that moment needs to take place. In terms of what we can do, look, uh, a part of one of the things that I've been doing as the TUC General Secretary is making sure that we are reaching out to third sector organizations, BME, black organizations, working with young people, giving them the opportunity to engage and to take leadership and to take up space um, and to be the voice for the sectors that they work in or a sector that they would like to work in as well. So that when we are engaging with politicians and other people where decisions are being made, you know, being made, that it's not me only talking about these issues, but that they're there as well. And I also have um, made sure that um, I, make, uh, I make myself available. So if somebody wants to, um, has got a problem, I always say to them, you don't have to, you know, I, I will speak to anyone. If you've got an issue or you need some help, then the union movement is here. You know, there's a helpline that's currently being set up but for um, black communities in Wales, the Wales TUC is going to be involved in that. We are going to be assisting people if they have a problem at work and, and also forwarding um, those queries on to, to unions, encouraging people to join unions in that way as well. We set up a whistleblowing site really early on so again, people could share information and we could pick that up and do something with it. What people need is action. And I think that each and every one of us who have been on this panel, we don't want to be the last ones. Even if you were the, the first at something, you want to be, don't want to be the last one or the only one. So I think that, you know, we've each got responsibilities too. Thank you all um, to participants, um, people who've been putting qu uh, questions and chat and suggestions in the chat and the Q&A. Fantastic panellists. I feel really inspired. I was going to ask you a last question, but we run out of time, which is about what joy you felt in the last few months. I have felt great joy from being inspired and reinvigorated. It sometimes felt in the last couple of months like we're going over old ground. But with colleagues like all of you, I really do feel quite optimistic even though we're in a really tough time so Wanda, Patrick, Shavana, Roger and Marvin somewhere out in the park somewhere thank you all so much thank you to Inners and the TUC Southwest for organizing Tollpuddle as always and hope to see us all next year like actually in Tollpuddle take care and stay safe everybody thank you <laughs>